Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new Redefining Security podcast. Have you ever thought that we are selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Perhaps we are. So let's look at how we can organize a successful InfoSec program that integrates people, process, technology, and culture to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation, allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io. All right, and here we are. You're very welcome to new Redefining Cybersecurity podcast episode on ITSB Magazine. And uh, here's where we get to talk about all things cyber as it relates to business. Um, but of course, not every business looks the same, right? And that a, lot of, a lot of security technologies are aimed at uh, financial institutions and retail operations and logistics and and uh, perhaps even manufacturing. But when we start talking about space and satellites and aerospace, which is not, not a new topic here on ITSP Magazine, uh, things tend to look a little different. <laughs> and uh, the, the systems look different, the communications look different, the knowledge required looks different to deploy and also uh, secure these systems. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about that today and, and a and a program and a, a capture the flag, a CTF that that a team does called Hackasat, uh, where they'll they'll describe it much more eloquently than I. But uh, people get to come together and have fun uh, banging on satellite technologies and see what they can break. Um, so that's my my lame layman's term of what's going on. We're going to get the real story here from Aaron, Logan, and Jason. Um, I'm going to start by asking each of you to share a few few bits about yourself, uh, who you are, what your role is uh, in, in life and or, or in your career, and then how that connects to uh, the Hackasat program, which I know is, is a group of folks that come together to, to pull this off, right? Um, many more than three of you, but you, the three of you get, get a lot of this stuff to work on. So I'll start with you, Aaron, a few things about yourself. So yeah, I'm uh, Aaron Myrick. I'm from the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, I've been in the space industry for uh, 17 years now, um, primarily working at the Aerospace Corporation, supporting a number of uh, DOD, uh, uh, Department of Defense programs, a number of NASA programs, uh, uh, a number of uh, test and experimental programs. Um, for Hackasat, I am the project lead for Moonlighter, which uh, we'll talk about today which is uh, the object of our game for Hackasat 4. And uh, we're also planning on using it to do a number of cybersecurity research related tasks. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Logan for his intro. Sure, um, my name is Logan Finch. Um, I work uh, for a cybersecurity company called Cromulence. Um, I am the principal engineer um, building the the Hackasat game um, that's going to be running on on the Moonlighter spacecraft. Um, I've been involved in Hackasat. Uh, this is my third year um, working on the CTF. So, um, kind of built up from uh, one of the earlier games to you know now finally being able to run things on a on a satellite in space uh, on Moonlight, and we're all very excited uh, both to, to build it and to hopefully see everything uh, go off without a hitch. <laughs> Just like any uh, true space program, right? <laughs> Jason. I'm Jason Williams, uh, CEO of Cromulence, uh, engineer, hacker, entrepreneur, um, self-professed space nerd at this point. Um, 
been involved in Hackasets since the very beginning and uh, really looking forward to this year. It's been a, a, a long journey and, and everything the team has accomplished. It's just been one fantastic competition and seeing it grow into what it is today and seeing it, you know, moving up in the rankings and CTF time and other things and, and how many people just absolutely love this conversation. It's been just what an incredible ride uh, to see it and, and looking forward to, um, you know, come August at DEF CON to see what the teams will bring and how things will go. Bring it, bring it. And uh, so I can... I can venture a guess that Hackasat is at least three years old because Logan's been involved <laughs> at least three years. Um, give me a little history and background on uh, how it started, why it started, and sure. uh, yeah, what, maybe what the goals and objectives are. And start with you, Jason, and the others can yeah. kind of jump in and fill in, fill in the details. Yeah, so um, I mean, Hackasat has been, uh, it started as just an idea um, uh, by uh, a person named um, uh, Frank Pound. And, and, and folks within uh, Air Force Research Laboratory back in uh, 2019 and uh, convinced some folks high up in the government to uh, spend some money. And uh, we all got together in uh, Wallops Island in early 2020 and, and kind of sketched out the game. Uh, it started in year one with uh, a very, I wouldn't say simple game, but it, it was, you know, we started with a carousel in an upstairs facility at Cromulence's um, office and uh, year two is kind of this hybrid design where we had a digital twin of the physics simulation and we had these hardware flat sats and then in year three we went all digital a completely all digital game where we had incorporated you know the flat sats the ground stations all together and each year was uh, moving in complexity you know to what we're seeing today where we're actually built a satellite launched a satellite at this point and going to be running a whole competition uh, in space, um, which is, is quite an incredible achievement. And Logan, how, how has, well, you came into it three years ago. So I'm wondering, did you follow it prior to that? And, and you wanted to jump in? I don't know if you have any, any, any insight. Um, on yeah, I kind of followed it the, the first year. Um, uh, one of the guys who uh, brought me to Cromulence, um, um, was somebody I had worked on, uh, worked with before at my previous company. Um, so, you know, I had seen kind of where things were and he, you know, gave me that, you know, that the spiel that, you know, this is something really cool to work on. And I gave it a chance and then came to Cromulence and really, you know, started to really enjoy working on, on these sorts of problems. Um, there's a lot of freedom to, you know, build a, build these solutions from the ground up and build, you know, fun, fun software to simulate a whole space system, you know, from end to end. Um, we're also, you know, building some hardware. Um, so we've built flat sets. So, you know, small, um, you know, stand-ins for, for a satellite that we can use for these, um, cybersecurity exercises. We used, um, a custom one in Hackaset, in Hackaset 2, um, an off-the-shelf one in Hackaset 1. And then, um, and then Hackaset 3 and 4 were all kind of leading up to this, uh, our, Hackaset 3 was leading up to our, um, launch of Moonlighter. So we built a, a fully digital version, um, that was in, um, an early analog to what we'll be running um, on the actual Moonlighter spacecraft. So it's a lot of fun to, you know, build these things and work kind of outside the confines of what you'd see in a um, in, in a normal aerospace application. Because that's my background is, you know, working for defense contractors, you know, building um, uh, big ground systems for um, large space programs. So that's this is certainly a, a lot more dynamic and, and, and fun an opportunity in a lot of ways. So... So for somebody like me, uh, that, that doesn't have that experience, uh, which would be cool to have, uh, I'm a little jealous if I'm honest. Um, but there's a lot to these environments, right? I don't know if, if one of you can kind of paint a picture of what's involved. I can, I can picture a data center, a control room connected to that, some cloud stuff through satellites, doing some communications to a, a device be it a spacecraft or a satellite or something, but there, there must be much more to it than, than that. So what, what do you, what's that look like in real life and how does Hackasat perhaps emulate? How much of that gets emulated in what you're putting together? So uh, what, what we do in real space systems is we typically have um, three uh, traditional, we call them segments. So three different things that we're trying to build. So we have a, a ground segment, um, which is 
the the command and control, the communication to the, to and from the vehicle. Um, so that's where you're doing a lot of your your mission planning. Um, you're tasking the vehicle. You're getting data back from the vehicle, and you're disseminating that data in whatever form it may be for that mission. Uh, then you have your link segment, which is the part that talks between your ground segment and your space vehicle. So this is traditionally like an RF link um, uh, of one form or another. You may have like a high speed link or a, a low speed link, depending on what kind of your state your vehicle is in. Um, and those can take the form of um, radio or uh, optical, um, optical being laser communications. Um, and then you have your your space segment, and that's the that's the vehicle, that's your sensor, that's um, sort of what this whole mission has built itself around. This is the reason why you're going into space, whether that's to do Earth imaging um, for uh, you know uh, climate research, or whether that's providing SATCOM or uh, some other mission. GPS is another great example. Um, and so that's that's a space segment. So e each of these are sort of specialized um, fields where you have engineers that that look at uh, well. And so your ground segment, there's a lot of software development that happens there um, that can be take the form of uh, databases, web GUIs, um, you know, your mission planning tools. You have a lot of uh, you know math people working that problem. On the space vehicle side, it's more of an embedded systems um, problem where you you have to have these actuators and sensors kind of cooperating and controlling the vehicle in a way that um, makes the mission happen. Um, so broadly speaking, that's kind of uh, what goes into a, a space system. There's also a fourth segment that um, we often don't talk about, even though we should. And that's the user segment. Um, the user segment, um, everyone probably listening to this podcast is part of a user segment for GPS um, because they directly receive signals from the vehicle and they process those and determine their their position on the earth and also get time from GPS. Yeah, really interesting. And uh, as you're talking and describing that scenario, I'm just wondering, are there, are there many... Uh laser traffic sniffing tools out there and people that are ex experts in using them um because let's let's be real i mean the, these systems are really expensive right and uh and oftentimes if well if they're delivering people to space or important things to space you don't want to uh you want to jeopardize life right or or the delivery um so a lot of risk involved there so Security is important, which is what we're here to talk about today, right? So securing these systems. And I don't know, our, our, I, I don't know of many laser <laughs> communications in, uh, in an enterprise IT environment, but there may be some enterprise IT environment type stuff in, in the space systems. So where, where does the knowledge set come from when we're looking to understand the exposure that these systems have, the risk, aka exploitability of them, and there, and then the, the final point of well, identifying controls and other mitigations to to protect them as they're as they're being built and running. Uh, how do people gain gain those skills in general, and and then more importantly, how does Hackasat help to bring some of those skills to bear? So actually, I think that's that's a good one. So I think um, Aaron's um, description of the different segments of of space systems is actually a really good place to start there. So for the ground system, that's usually, you know, terrestrial networks, just like any other um, network system. So the types of skills for defending that are, you know, usually pretty similar to, to any other um, network based system. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of people that can do that. That's um, usually the, the easiest part of like a cybersecurity defense on the space side. Um, historically, it's been um, security through obscurity and, you know, oh, this is in space, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's no, nobody can get into our command link and our telemetry link. So, you know, it's safe, but there it's an embedded system. So, you know, like any other embedded system, there's, you know, there's all sorts of security practices you can apply. Um, and a lot of those things have been, um, you know, pioneered and 
Um, the state of the art has been pushed forward for, you know, all sorts of other embedded applications um, in terms of how to, you know, handle firmware security, um, data security and transit between different components, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, overall, the space community has been a little bit slow to um, adopt a lot of those things um, for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, I think, over, you know, going forward, that's kind of our goal on Hackasat is to, you know, show that, Yes, we can secure the ground, but we also need to, you know, think about space systems, you know, as a whole holistic entity and, you know, make sure we're thinking about all the different parts uh, uh, from a security standpoint to, to make sure that, you know, we're not missing things that, you know, um, that, you know, might be, might even seem obvious, but, you know, it, historically have just been, um, you know, not addressed. Yeah. And, and Hackasat was one of the reasons for Hackasat was to, bridge these communities like the cybersecurity community and the aerospace community. And, and, you know, one, one interesting thing about it to me was just how little I think the cybersecurity community knew about these systems, you know, and how little the aerospace community knew about kind of like the capabilities of the cybersecurity community. And when these two came together, we saw some incredible things happening in Hackasat. We saw, you know, teams that were, like performing space operations and like creating operations dashboards and stuff like that in the competition, developing these, these tools and employing these tools at speeds that I think folk, folks in the aerospace community just never thought possible. Like they were just like mind blown. I, I remember actually, is it Hackasat 2, I think we were, we were all, there was a screenshot posted, I think it was on Twitter from one of the teams and it looked very similar to our internal operations dashboard that we had. And we were like, did we get hacked? <laughs> you know, like, no, no, this team had created this dashboard during the competition, during the competition. We're talking less than a week, you know, just two days, really. And and they were automating um, a lot of their 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 operations, their ability to throw exploits. We they, they 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 were getting telemetry from the other team satellites and they were they were looking at they knew the battery levels of the other team satellites from their telemetry streams and they were graphing that in, in, in these dashboards. And I and we were all super impressed. And it was a brief moment we had a panic attack, but uh, you know it really showed us the capabilities of these people like extreme programming, these hackers to to do this. But conversely we also saw a team that was a bunch of hackers struggle on the space operation side and 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 they thought well who cares like you know we're gonna we're hackers we'll figure it out and and they they didn't pay attention to to their satellite and maintaining power levels and and, and pointing and attitude control and all these other things and and hack said i really think the best teams merged those two disciplines as two groups together and created like a super team if you will of folks and and that was just awe inspiring for me to see and and, and it occur and and for us to put together a competition where that was able, you know, we were able to get that kind of like camaraderie and that spirit together and, and, and two disciplines to really start working together. And, and hopefully that continues in industry and, and government and so forth um, where people realize that's, that's how you help secure these systems in the future. And we're talking systems that are going to be around like a lot of these spacecraft systems, you know, they, they get deployed and they, they stay around for decades in some cases. And so like, that's a, that's a hard problem from a cybersecurity's perspective. We're used to up, upgrading our windows, you know, operating system or something like that every, you know, couple of years, right. And on a spacecraft, you know, are you going to upgrade the operating system, you know, of, of your spacecraft or the firmware like that, like constantly do that. They're very risk adverse in that kind of environment. Um, and so, you know, those kind of con ops don't make sense. And so you really have to think about, you know, what the attack vectors are and how to secure these systems. And it's a different way of thinking, you know, uh, it definitely is something very challenging because there's a lot more pressure in the design and operation side than there is kind of on these terrestrial systems, on these traditional ground networks, right? That you don't, that you have in spacecraft system where it's like, I, I spent tens of millions, hundreds of million dollars building this craft and it's in orbit now. Uh, how do I maintain like the security of that system, right? And, and do that in an economical fashion. So it's a challenge for sure. Yeah, and Aaron, I, I want your thoughts here because I, I had the, the fortune of working with a lot of uh, military companies that uh, required terrestrial network security from the company that I was working for at the time. And their, their delivery models were extremely complex and extremely long, right? So they had to think of a lot of, 
of these scenarios up front and build systems that could last for a long time. And then the, the approval process and, and the, uh, the, the checklist that vendors had to go through to be part of the, the, the final delivery that would last for years before that whole, whole thing went through again. And it couldn't be updated by the way, once it was <laughs> signed off on, um, very different mindset than from I'm a hacker. I have no rules. I'm going to go for this. I can stay up 24 hours. I don't care. I have, uh, I have my, my caffeine caffeinated drink on the ready and all bets off, right? I, I can do whatever I want. Um, I don't care if the system's up for a day or 10 years, if I can access it. So how does, how do those two mindsets come together? And maybe this is a good time to, to talk about how you create the hack a environment. I don't know if, if you want to start getting into some of the moonlighter things and how you create that and maybe how those two mindsets come together as you put this, this program together. Yeah. So, you, you, I mean, you're right about, you know, once we deliver things, um, it's really hard to change things in operations. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we should start thinking about doing and, and we are starting to, to do is start drawing those lines in the sand of um, cyber compliance versus cyber operations. So, Compliance is, you know, making sure your you do your vulnerability assessment, your uh, your re your reporting is is done, you're logging all the data. Cyber operations is, um, you know, what do you do in the event that something goes wrong? And we need to be able to build systems that can recover from cyber events, not only detect and identify, but recover from those things, um, because for our space systems, we we don't get a chance to launch a new one very often. And they're expensive. They're they, the, the at least the on the defense side, those vehicles are, are um, you know, they're few and far between and they take a long time to build. There's a lot of engineering behind them. So we can't um, have it. So, you know, the small things trip us up. Um, and so that kind of led us into what we wanted to do with with Moonlighter because, you know, I was there with Jason and Wallops back in 2019 and we we wanted to do something on, on orbit and we kind of had to constrain that quite significantly um, because when we're doing a cyber activity or cyber exercise with an, another mission system, it's potentially putting that mission system at risk, right? So that's really hard for people to bite off on. So what we what we said early on is that in order to do this right, in order to have a proper environment where we can do this kind of research and kind of understand the problem a little bit better is to build something from the ground up. So we have we bring the cyber people into the room, into the design process and say, hey, we want to build a vehicle to do you know, X, Y and Z. How would you guys go about attacking it? And, and so then from that, um, we started building in um, either protections, mitigations, alternate paths of doing things that, that we would need to do for recovery of the vehicle. Um, and that's sort of how we ended up with, with Moonlighter as it is, as it is now, um, by bringing cyber people into the room and bringing them along with the design process. I love that. And I, I want Logan and Jason's uh, input on this as well, because I mean, all too often we build something, toss it over the fence or toss it into the market more appropriately and hope for the best. And, and then we get alerted when, when there's something wrong. Um, I love that you brought the, the analysis part up front into the design, um, which I think even just even just analyzing a system in the real world, it's hard to do with space. I don't, I don't remember the last time I, I found a, a spacecraft available on eBay for me to buy and hack. So, so having an opportunity to be part of this part of the of the of the program is super cool as well. So, I don't, Logan, Jason, any any additional thoughts on on this? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, Jason and I were both involved actually in in the um, some of the. Um, design uh, work that went into building Moonlighter. And, you know, we were able to influence certain aspects of, of the design to, you know, hopefully make it look like, uh, you know, what we've both built before and make something that's flexible that we can, um, you know, 
both build a and run a cyber competition on, but also something that you know can can you know act as a test bed for um, this kind of research going forward, since it's a you know a very unique platform to be able to um, you know set up and and, and do this uh, do you know a cybersecurity evaluations um, on orbit. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure we thought about, you know, what, what would we want there and what sort of, um, um, what sort of system would we want to provide to the end user um, that would be, you know, using the, the platform. Can I, can I, maybe Jason, if you, uh, your thoughts yeah, in general, but, but also um, without giving anything, anything away, of course, mm -hmm. um, changes in, in how something was built or designed, did you, Oh, this this uh, communication channel is rife with uh, weakness, or or the or this or this uh, operating system, or this particular particular piece of hardware uh, is is uh, vulnerable to exploit or whatever. I'm making stuff up because I don't know. What can you share with us that doesn't give the the CTF away? That says, being part of this early on, we were able to create a much more resilient system. Yeah, I think, um, been, yeah, later. Yeah, it's not going to give anything away, but, um, you know, one of the, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Um, you know, we're going to invite hackers, we're going to let them on the spacecraft, right? And we're going to, we're going to let them do what they want, like in this, in this, you know, protected domain. And we think it's protected, right? We want it to be protected, right? And that's actually, you know, um, normally you protect at a different perimeter, right? Like you would protect at the ground station level, or you, you know, and you can, and like Aaron said earlier in that architecture, but here we're, we're putting them right onto the vehicle and, and putting these, some of the world's best hackers, I'll say that, uh, they sh truly are onto this vehicle. And so there was a lot of design challenges, you know, from us, I, I, I would go back to organizing CTFs. I, I, I was part of a legitimate business syndicate for, for DEF CON CTF, you know, and look at it from an organizer perspective and you know things can and do go wrong right and as an organizer you know there's a lot of challenges now we have to talk to a spacecraft and and as the organizers and so you know our view of the world is through these contact windows just kind of like the team's view of, of the spacecraft is and so there's there's an an, an in number of ch challenges that we had to overcome and risks and things like that we had to incorporate in the design of the spacecraft. And I think those are things you can learn actually and apply maybe when you, you take this posture um, as a designer of spacecraft, like, okay, if, if what if the worst case scenario came true and, and, and a, a threat actor managed to get onto my spacecraft, get onto my uh, command and control network. And what, what if they were able to, to take over some component on the spacecraft, you know, how do I know that I can get them off um, and, and get that system to be resilient? Because like, like Aaron said, are you going to relaunch your satellites or are you going to go up there and, and, and capture them and forensically analyze and try to provably remove the, the threat actor, you know, code? Um, and obviously you have a mission that you're trying to accomplish. And, and so it's a very dynamic environment with very limited access that you have in introspection of the system. These downlink, these links, they're precious, right? Like, you know, uh, the, we still haven't mastered the way to make data links better, you know, um, you know, they're, they're getting better, but the, we, we, we don't have like your 10 gigabit ethernet connection, right? We don't have that ethernet connection to your satellite. Um, and so these were all aspects we had to incorporate in the design, uh, in our, uh, uh dynamic of the game and, and designing it. And, and it's, you know, I, I truly think it's one of those really challenging things. And the team is, uh, come up with, you know, something really cool and, and creative. And, you know, there's always, there's room for innovation for sure in this, this domain. And I hope, you know, this kind of competition continues to go on because it really is challenging a lot of disciplines, a lot of engineering, uh, cybersecurity, you know, concerns and that sort of thing. And I'm going to get to the, the actual event, uh, at DEF CON in a second, uh, but Logan, I'm going to back to you and maybe Aaron, if you, if you want to chime in as well, but if I'm not mistaken, from what I heard, th this isn't, take a system and virtualize it or replicate it in an environment that can be hacked. This is you're creating a research platform or development platform that you hope to use for real, that you've designed with security people to be part of that up front, And now you're letting them play in this environment that is maybe not 
I don't know, maybe it is commercial, but destined to be commercial in some sense, open to play with now at Hackasset. Did I capture that correctly? I think that sounds good. I think kind of, you know, our, our, our philosophy was to have a sandbox for cybersecurity in space, you know, a, 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 a area where, where the resiliency of, of the system is, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, well-defined and that we know, you know, know how to recover things, but, but able to still provide, you know, something that, that, that were meaningful, you know, research and, uh, um, interactions can occur, um, so we can, you know, both, you know, see what what uh, what some of these teams end up doing, um, and, and hopefully learn from them, uh, and also, you know, just by designing and building this, we're learning about, you know, what would it take to actually, you know, incorporate this sort of design principle into into other systems as well. Yeah, because that's the key, right, Aaron? Is it, it's not just to have fun and 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 bring these communities together. It's to actually make space safer. Yeah. So, you know, one of the interesting trends that we're sort of seeing in the space world, at least that I've, that I've been seeing is, you know, as the cost of launch is being driven down, um, satellite systems are much more um, um, open to taking on commodity hardware. And we're, so we're talking like industrial grade components or automotive grade components um, be, because they, at least at the low earth orbit, they can survive those environments still. So the 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 processing uh, power that's in the automated um, the automotive community with their you know automation self driving cars is actually driving some of the software that we're putting into some of our space vehicles. So some of their real time operating systems I've started to see move over into the space community. So the the cost of launches being driven down, but also the access to the hardware and software that people have at their fingertips now um, is is much more open so it's not boutique anymore you don't need to understand how to code an ada um, or or fortran to understand uh, flight software anymore um, so it's 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 very interesting and, and uh, so one of the things that i enjoy from hackersite is understanding how um, different teams approach the same problem and 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 the things that we can learn from their approaches, the things that they build, um, sometimes the the actions that they throw against the vehicle are also interesting as well, because then we can take that and kind of understand it more, extract it a little bit. And, um, and then we can sort of postulate, okay, well, what if this is successful on a real vehicle? What do we do now? How do we how do we have the appropriate tactics, techniques, and procedures from the defender side to uh, detect and mitigate, or if it were to be successful, how do we recover from that? Um, and so that's, you know, things that have often been studied in labs, um, but have not been played out to their full end-to-end -end scenario in a live platform. And so there's always things in simulations and emulations where um, it's, it's not quite the same um, as when you do something on orbit on an alive system. I love it. So let's talk about the, the actual event now. So the it's a CTF that runs for a period of time at all, all of DEF CON, I presume. Is there stuff before DEF CON people can get, in, get involved with? So talk to me about today. We're early June. Uh, now through August at DEF CON and beyond if it does. Um, what can people expect? Who can get involved? What's required? What, what, uh, sure, absolutely. Give me an yeah. overview of all that stuff. So, uh, for Hackset 4, the qualification event, um, was, took place in early April. Um, that's already happened. So, the, the qualifying teams for the final event at DEF CON are already chosen, um, and they're already, uh, um, we're in the process of getting everything finalized there. Um, so those teams are, you know, selected at this point. Um, so we know who's going to be playing at the actual conference. Um, we're going to have a two full days of competition. Um, uh, I believe it's on the, the Friday and the Saturday of the DEF CON conference week. Um, to get involved, um, if you're at the DEF CON conference, um, come and visit the Aerospace Village. Um, we're going to have a, a, a presence there. The competition is going to be happening live um, on the conference floor in the Aerospace Village. 
Um, so you can come say hi to the to uh, members of the tech team. There'll be people there to do outreach and answer questions, and uh, you can kind of see what's going on. We're going to have screens up with status and um, you know how the competition is going. Um, hopefully, other interesting visuals as well um, to kind of uh, set the scene. Um, and then there'll also be a live stream um, that uh, should be going, I believe, through the AFRL, uh, so the Air Force Research Lab um, uh, YouTube account. Um, that will also have updates and other information kind of going on throughout throughout the the conference. So uh, another thing that you know, I just will uh, I'll toot Cronlitz's horn a little bit here. Um, they they've actually released all of the the previous qualifying challenges that were done for Hackathon One, Two, and Three. Um, so they have the on a GitHub repo. You can go and and do some of the challenges that people did for for Hackasaf qualifications and and the finals. Um, I believe for one and two are up there, along with uh, some of the reporting that the teams do, like how they solve things, how they did things during those events. So that's all hosted online. Jason, anything else? Yeah, I I I think it's interesting to me because you know. What's going on behind the scenes with the the infrastructure team and our team is is incredible right now. <laughs> you know, um, we got a satellite that's at, at, when does it go and get you know launched from the ISS, I guess. Um, and then it you know it's it's a real satellite, so it's got to go through all the standard things. It's got to go through checkout, comms check. It's got to you know we got to check the health and state, safety of the vehicle. We've got to you know do all these things um, before the game. So so from our perspective, it's this this kind of there's a lot going on from the team's perspective, you know, they're, they're, they're preparing, they're building their tools. Some might be some, some might not. I would imagine the teams that want to win they're they're, they're kind of gearing up for this. Um, and, and, and they're looking back and, and, and piecing together all the previous games and everything that worked for them and building up kind of their tool chains and, and getting their logistics figured out. Uh, and then their, their plan to go to Vegas, you know, cause the, we're, it's an in-person, you know, this is the first time actually for Hackasat. First time we've, we've done an in-person competition. It's going to be really cool. It's going to be out in Vegas and packing their bags and flying out to Vegas. And then, you know, we're going to have some, you know, like we always do, we're going to release data before the game. And then, you know, game time, they're going to come into the room and they're, and they're going to connect to our infrastructure and then, and then it's going to be go. It's going to be go once that 10 o'clock starts. Um, and, and so a lot goes on on our end, uh, you know, uh, just like the team. So, so we're, we're working really hard. Sounds like, and before we, uh, before we started, you said you, your, your efforts are probably a lot harder than the, than the teams. They may not think that of course, when they're, when they're doing their thing, but, uh, yeah, just like, sounds like any, any space program, there's a lot to, uh, a lot to get yeah. going here. Well, listen, hopefully, um, hopefully, well, we'll get a chance to see you in the aerospace village. We're uh, huge fans of that. And Steve Mazinski and the whole crew there and, and, uh, I love what they're doing and glad to hear you you have this competition going live within that as part of defcon aerospace village there and uh with any luck we'll get we'll get to chat with you live from sure. from the events uh of course following defcon uh, recording rules we're not gonna not gonna break any privacy things there uh, mm -hmm. we know the pr team so we we, we yeah. try to be friendly on that respect but uh yeah so we wish you the best on that for sure and uh, hopefully for those that not, aren't participating, how, I guess the question for them would be outside of the, the grander, uh, aerospace village experience and what they can gain from that. What, um, what can they do to watch or participate or at least, at least watch, uh, the, the live CTF, what, what can they do the screens and what else you, you guys are going to be there to chat with them as well. Right. Yeah, I would say that, um, it, follow hackers at twitter because they're gonna probably they're gonna put out all the links for um all the streams or youtube events that they do um so that that would probably be the best source of information for the current happenings of of hackers at um and then you know if you go on to .com, you'll find a link in the players corner of the the github repos that i was talking about earlier Love it. All right. Well, Aaron, Logan, Jason. Hey, yeah. Sean, I got one more thing to add. All Shout right. out to, to uh, the United States Space Force and, and the Air Force Research Laboratory. 
uh, they, you know, they made this possible. Um, and, and so, you know, it's been an incredible journey. I think everybody appreciates, you know, what they've done, what the, the U S government's done for this, um, in the aerospace community. i certainly know that we have. Um, and so I just want to recognize that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I appreciate that call out as well. And, uh, yeah, I kind of alluded to it at the beginning, but, uh, I mean, it's a whole group of you, the three of you are here representing and I'm grateful for that, but there's a big team that helps pull this all together. And, uh, yeah, shout out to all them on, on your behalf from me uh, to make this possible. So, um, yep, good luck with everything. Hopefully the, the mission uh, is a success and that uh, the learnings are, are deep and, uh, and meaningful <laughs> and that everybody has fun as they get together in person for the first time at Hackasat 4. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And thanks. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Redefining Cybersecurity. And, uh, of course, there'll be a, a slew of links in the show notes to uh, the things we talked about today and and uh, our guest profile. So if you want to reach out to them, you can, you can connect with them as well. So uh, thanks for listening, watching, sharing, subscribing. Keep well, everybody. Talk to you soon. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation, allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Security Podcast. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. <laughs>